Great, we're going to get started, everyone. Um, and I have, I'd like to start by welcoming, welcoming everyone to our second event on the upcoming US elections in our series, America Votes. We're very excited to have Lauren Manis, one of the leading climate organizers in the United States, here to talk with us about the 2024 election, climate policy in the country, and how the climate movement is looking at a possible Harris or Trump presidency. Before we get started, I'd like to introduce Mrs. Manis and remind everyone as well of the interpretation function at the bottom of your screen here in Zoom, in case you'd prefer to listen in German. Mrs. Manis served as the Sunrise Movement's Federal Advocacy Director from 2018 to 2022, where she translated the electoral and organizing power of young people into political and policy progress towards a Green New Deal. Notably, she played a key role in driving the movement's demands into what became the Inflation Reduction Act and the American Climate Corps. She is now the political director of If Not Now, a movement of American Jews standing up for equality, justice, and a thriving future for all. Mrs. Manis has given speeches and written articles on youth engagement and the fight for a sustainable future, a livable planet, and climate justice. She's protested in the halls of Congress and lobbied legislators to get the changes the planet needs. She's led the charge on getting the Inflation um, Reduction Act, America's uh, largest climate legislation passed, and helped secure the American Climate Corps, a jobs training program that fights the worst effects of climate change with young people um, while also giving them jobs training. For everyone tuning in, I'll start with some questions, and then we'll take some from the audience using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So please make sure to use that. You can type questions in at any point uh, during the conversation today. Like I've said a couple times, this event is also translated into German. So if you'd prefer, please use that function to listen in auf Deutsch. Mrs. Manis, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, glad to be here. Um, great, uh, I think we'll just jump right into it then. Great. Um, so I'd like to know uh, your thoughts on some of the notable steps uh, to fight climate change that we've seen under Biden's presidency um, and how we've shifted from this big movement, especially at the start of his presidency in the first two years before the midterms, where climate seemed to play a big role into the election that we're now having this year. Um, it seems like climate, to me at least, has taken a bit of a backseat related to other issues. Um, relative to the 2020 election. And I'd like to know how you assess the cl uh, climate activism's impact on the 2024 election, and if you agree it's become less prominent and why you think that might be the case. Totally. Um, yeah, this has been on my heart and mind a lot as well and trying to make sense of it, um, watching some of the debates and, um, of course, like with Biden, the transition to Harris. Um, and... Yeah, feeling the consequences of uh, the climate crisis with wildfires on the West Coast and out West in the United States. Um, just, I think, last week, uh, Hurricane Francine um, in the, the Gulf. Um, and yeah, having that not super felt um, in those that visceral way. Um, and then also, of course, getting reports, you know, nearly daily basis that this is the hottest summer on record, that's the hottest year on record, um, that, you know, scientifically we have a very, very small shot of staying under the two degree um uh Celsius like Paris Agreement, um, which was already you know, a, a pretty dire state. Um, and yeah, I think right now, um, when looking at the the state of the US election and reading kind of major media about it on a daily basis, that's not necessarily being felt and being communicated. Um, but I do think what is being felt and communicated is um, like the daily struggles that uh, intersect extremely closely um, on basically every issue um, with the consequences of the climate crisis. Um, and yeah, and then the daily struggles that are only exacerbated um, by warming, by major storms, by, um, yeah, uh, migration, et cetera. So um, just to make that more specific, I think, um, you know, there there has been major inflation. Um, and what I think we can see is the um, the result of 
the climate movement and what Biden has achieved is that like <laughs> the the tenants of the Green New Deal, the structure that was supposed to be, we should address climate policy through industrial policy, through green jobs, through um, expanding a uh, you know dignified union workforce, um, and through um, yeah expanding the public sector, meaning people's basic needs, electrifying people's houses, electrifying schools. So that was embedded as like the Green New Deal mentality on the best way to kind of go about a transformative, um, yeah, how to transform the economy in the face of the climate crisis. And if you look at much of the Inflation Reduction Act, it actually, although like it would be nice if it was a more popular name that got to be like celebrated as something that people understood. It actually is kind of representative, I think, of the way that um, the Green New Deal and this like, uh, you know, people forward um, felt needs forward climate policy um, is reflected that is harder to see that it's like, this big industrial policy, um, but actually it's kind of felt in people's lives that it's about um, addressing lowering lowering um, electricity prices and utility prices, like making uh, transit greener and having more tax credits towards um, getting electric vehicles. And that is kind of all in the face of, um, yeah, like this kind of economic struggles that the climate crisis intersects that we actually have been able to deliver to people some like real um, climate benefits that also are like financial benefits in their daily lives. Um, but that's obviously also hard to communicate. Um, but that is the the um, reality um, in a lot of ways. Um, and yeah, and then I guess we could talk about um, the like some of the those were some of the successes, even though there's drawbacks of the successes. And then um, yeah, I think some of the the drawbacks are um, right now with uh, yeah with the crisis in the in the Middle East in the the ongoing war in Gaza. Um, that has really taken a lot of the attention <laughs> away from sort of this um, really dominant like climate emergency narrative um, and also made it slightly hard to um, be focused on having the Democratic Party in the U.S. Uh, really like be the party of like a beautiful climate future um, when at the same time um, this really grave atrocity is going on um, that, you know, the Democratic Party has not taken a, a super bold step in um, challenging. And so I think that is a direct consequence also of seeing, um, of not seeing as much of the the climate forward distinction um, that the Democratic Party is adopting. Yeah. Um, great. Um, I, I want to keep talking about the IRA too, if that's uh, possible, um, both because of like your role um, in getting it through um, and also like the historic nature of the bill. Um, and I'd like to know how you assess it um, as a, a thing to fight climate change, as a tool to do that in the first place, um, but also very importantly as as something that that obviously went through Congress um, that that required votes from people like Joe Manchin, who who is the opposite of of someone who who believes in climate change and fights for it, um, and so how you see it as as like the balance of successes inside the bill, failures, um, and places for um, improvement um, as as this big thing that's like the first climate legislation we've ever really done in the U.S., um, but then something that's been very moderated by uh, the political climate. Yeah, so I think it's absolutely worth celebrating. And at the same time, um, we needed this about like 
at least a decade ago, um, and even so greater. Um, and it was extremely constrained by just the nature of U.S. democratic functions and systems that are um, pretty restrictive, like the filibuster, for example. Um, so, yeah, I think it was at like point blank the biggest, most substantial uh Tack, like a uh, thing that the U.S. has ever done <laughs> um, to actually address the climate crisis and meaningfully put government resources towards transitioning off fossil fuels. Like that is absolutely true um, and not to be taken for granted at all. The impacts are innumerable. Um, it, it really has already um, put into place a lot of um, transitions across uh, the economy and incentivized a transition off of fossil fuels in the energy sector, in basically every sector, energy, transportation, because of the, the way that it's all connected to energy. So even agriculture, um, housing, uh, et cetera, and buildings more at large. Um, and um, yeah, there were the the limitations were that it was all investment forward so the way that it's structured and i was very much in the the weeds of like creating some of these incentives versus um you know you can't really create punishments so like carrot and stick but you can um say what people will get rewarded money for versus what they won't um and so a lot of the debate and you know, compromising with Joe Manchin in order to get those votes um, came down to the the um, benchmarks that people would receive in, in tax incentives, um, tax rebates, et cetera. Um, and yeah, I think like it's strong in a lot of ways and we weren't able to actually create new standards of saying like really in order to address to like substantially transition these sectors um, that what scientifically demands, we would need some standards in here that would, um, yeah, like create new pieces of legislation, um, you know, ban <laughs> um, subsidizing fossil fuels. Um, uh, and that wasn't possible. And so it's all about money flows and that leaves it up to agencies and the administration to really work to decide who gets the money um and uh i think luckily under the biden administration i know there's some really really uh, politically aligned movement accountable people working to make sure the money gets into hands of unionized labor of um organizations and cooperatives that are you know at the front lines of the climate crisis and have demonstrated really um, strong community-based solutions to uh, use the money to you know have positive feedback on the ground. Um, and I think this is what's really scary is that with because it wasn't a piece of legislation that was uh, codified, um, and it's really like I mean it was a piece of legislation that was codified through the investment process but because it it wasn't like um new law per se um that like changed codes um it is subject to uh agencies deciding who gets money um and it is subject to of course the supreme court then saying agencies can't make those decisions um and i think it is really up in the air um, with the next presidential administration, how the, that money will get spent. Um, and even, yeah, even um, in the IRA, some of the compromises to even spend the renewable energy money was to also include, um, you know, the, the permission for a new uh, gas pipeline in Mansion State of West Virginia, um, the Mountain Valley Pipeline. So I think it's really about fighting to make sure um, everything that was passed gets into the hands of 
you know, Green New Deal um, aligned um, projects and people. Um, and a lot of that is happening. Um, a lot of the movement work is kind of following the money down to implementation and um, and the pieces that uh, were less good are being fought. So, you know, a lot of the leasing sales for new oil drilling um, and gas drilling or yeah, and um, fracking and um yeah, some of the construction sites like are being fought and have not been actually been able to be constructed because of state legal battles, et cetera, um, activists putting their bodies on the line. But of course, as we go into um, like what a Trump administration could look like is obviously cracking down on activism, um, you know, uh, putting in new uh, judges, um, at all levels of government, um, and the staff, uh, at agencies and the administration, obviously getting to decide where the money goes. And that is all really threatening, <laughs> um, and up for, yeah, up for contention. Yeah. I'd actually like to, to kind of go in a bit deeper on that if if you don't mind mm -hmm. um since so uh, as as you've described with the ira like such a key part of it is who holds the white house how those agencies are staffed um and i i'd like to see what you think about you've touched on it a bit about what a trump administration might look like but then also um you know, it's not just judges, it's the staff, it's the kind of outside things too, like cracking down on protests uh, that would have an effect here. Um, and, and, but also what it might look like under a Harris administration, if, if we'd expect to see it becoming more progressive, it, it also may be re, um, retreating a little bit from what was passed or, or staying about the same and, and how you assess uh, the likelihood of that under, under both different administrations. Um, yeah, um, I think I mostly touched on some of the threats under a Trump administration. Um, and of course, there's uh, really brilliant people working to make sure that um, we have all the scenarios of like who holds different legal mechanisms. So in states that maybe have a Democratic trifecta or, um, you know, where we can push back and um, make sure that still we do as much harm reduction as possible. Um, and yeah, and the good news is that a lot of the money has been out the door already. And that was like the main priority <laughs> under this administration um, and what climate the climate movement have been fighting for is like pass it and get the money out because this was also, you know, politically speaking, the our strategy to say this is how we need to sustain governing power. Um, this is how we can actually win the 2024 election is by giving people what they need um, by meaningfully using government uh, resources to tackle the climate crisis um, and the economic crisis at the same time. Um, and so since the, mo since the money that has been out the door is only bearing fruit and you know, no matter some of the Trump policies, like, uh, it is companies that are making renewable energy are more incentivized to do that, um, just because of the global tide towards renewable energy. And, um, yeah, and that has really been spurred by a lot of the, the money that got out early. Um, and yeah, also once people have a tax rebate to weatherize their homes, they don't want to go back. Once they have don't have to put gas in their cars anymore, once they get um, you know, public transit that is uh accessible and doesn't create fumes and um yeah, schools that can serve as uh, you know, resilient community centers, like once people have these needs met, then they don't want to revert back. And that in and of itself is a really strong resistance against whatever Trump tries to do, because people know what they need against this crisis. Um, 
and will actually keep fighting for that. Um, and that is also obviously the movement's responsibility to bolster that. Um, and then, yeah, under a uh, Harris presidency, I think um, there's likely only more room to make it more progressive. Um, I think some of the, you know, some of the battles that have come up around climate, like her being supportive of fracking in Pennsylvania, like, I think a lot of that is rhetoric. Um, and honestly, there's like a lot of <laughs> the political apparatus in Pennsylvania is like pretty opposed to fracking. Um, a lot of even uh, like Trump voters in Pennsylvania are opposed to fracking um, just because it is so locally felt, like individually felt on people's land and property and in their communities um, that, yeah there's been a ton of organizing and resistance to that. So I think, yeah, the climate movement is pretty well poised to use a lot of Harris's commitments um, and record and hold her to that and um, use the, you know, the momentum from the IRA to only make it um, go further. And um, I, I would hope uh, that the climate movement would also recognize like the real threats um, that uh, democratically speaking and structurally speaking, like that have gotten in the way and like make sure that we don't get this precarious again of being like, um, yeah, we could either like continue to uh, decarbonize and like continue to be on this path that we've worked really hard to like um, make things at, save as many lives as possible. Um, or because there's a filibuster and because we have, um, the Supreme Court structure that we have, like this could all actually turn in a totally different direction. Um, and, you know, we could reach five degrees, six degrees, like literally because of these democratic, like undemocratic structures. Um, and there's obviously so much that's like a whole nother talk. Um, but I I think the climate movement's task under a Harris administration is to really um, make sure that the money gets into hands of unionized labor and to really fight to make sure that um, pieces of legislation like the PRO Act are passed um, and to really take on a lot of the democracy reform issues um, because the climate movement has had success in popularizing the urgency around um, the need for money to tackle climate crisis, the, the idea that it needs to be kind of industrial policy, full economic um, transition, um, and, you know, meet people's needs and not be uh, technocratic and like mediating. Um, uh, yeah. Um, and I think where push will come to shove around like um, making those wins more durable to some of these threats um, and making the, the benefits like compound is really in the hands of the labor movement and making sure that we can keep winning the wins and, not, and that we're not up against these um, really undemocratic structures that get in the way. Yeah, I, I think that point, I, I think about that point of, about fracking all the time, specifically as, as someone from a place where there's a lot of fracking, um, it, it, the the immediacy of, of like, it's not just that the carbon's getting burned later, but then also your your house is getting broken by earthquakes, um, your drinking water is poisoned, um, like the immediacy is kind of different um, from more traditional uh, oil drilling. Um, yeah, and I think it's it just doesn't make sense really to like win as a strategy to win voters in that state because the people in that state are most acutely like primed to understand the lies of the fossil fuel industry or like of, you know, all this money being spent. Um, so the, the kind of like lies about how fracking can be such a boom and like is, has all this support behind it. It, it, actually like works a little bit better outside of the states that have the acute impacts of that damage um so it's like if you're trying to win pennsylvania like maybe don't spew lies that people have daily um 
real experience. Know, yeah. Experiences <laughs> with, yeah. Yeah. Um, something that uh, bigger that I want to talk about that you already touched on um, that I, I think is is both in a lot of ways unique, um, but also a sign of something really interesting and, and really enheartening is the like interplay between the climate movement and the labor movement at the same time. Um, mm-hmm. And how that in a lot of ways played a key role in getting the IRA across the line. Um, I'm wondering how you think about like the climate labor coalition or coalitions, right? Um, how they're relating to each other right now, um, and how you think um, like they'll interact no matter who's president next term. Um, in terms of trying to advance this this agenda for the planet, um, you know, wh- when I think about last year, for example, the UAW's successful strike against the big three included a direct climate component, right? Um, mm-hmm. Saying you're not going to build new car factories for electric vehicles and then use non-union labor, right? Um, That strategy seems to have been very meaningfully successful. Um, And then also having them come behind the IRA and say, we believe in this because we believe it's going to produce the good jobs that we want for our members. Um, I'm wondering how you see that coalition developing um, under a Harris or Trump administration and also how, how you how you saw it like form um, in your time with Sunrise uh, from like there were not that many or super close relations between climate and labor. And now it seems like the, the two movements are a lot closer together. Yeah, totally. It's definitely very heartening. Um and I think not not that it's this doesn't negate the fact that it's heartening. I think it's honestly just like um, an impact of the the kind of reality that we're experiencing um, and that, you know, often movements are pushing things that we're like, we see this coming a few years down the line. Like we know this is in our shared interest. Um and we just get to, you know, hold the needle like and move people towards that. But it's often what is like right and what is um, going to happen, probably. Um, and it is uh, always up against, um, you know, just the very small um, number of people that are only prioritizing profit against everyone else's interest. Um, but I think what we saw in the climate and labor coalitions coming together is something that we've always known that, um, you know, systemic crises and injustice affect the masses of people. Um, and that is, uh, you know, all of, um, our voting body, all of our, you know, our, our, um, the, the, the people that are accountable, that we are accountable to as movements and also that unions organize and their workers against the bosses. Um, And so in the, in whatever, you know, economic shift, like the first people that need to be protected and that unions have a responsibility to protect are workers. Um, And I think in a transition that was, somewhat inevitable of saying like, we literally can't survive um, a an economy that continues to burn fossil fuels. Um, and that is just becoming clear year after year, like it is the hottest year on record, like this cannot be a continued status quo, that changes off fossil fuels have to happen. And unions are realizing that it is their responsibility to make sure that their workers are protected in um, whatever changes, like, you know, beyond the climate crisis, um, changes of an administration and new laws, changes, um, yeah, throughout all all periods of history. And so this one, um, I think, took time to get through some of the rhetoric that, like, it was climate versus jobs. It took movements really Um, being out there and doing political education and doing organizing as it always does. Um, And when it was adopted, it was really powerful. And it's, um, it's obviously a better position for union self interest to embrace that transition and say, like, actually, we want to be in the negotiating room saying, like, we want to be the 
um, union that, um, you know, has our workers do do this project. Um, we want this project to be as um, pro labor as possible. And if we abstain from that, um, because we're just committed to, you know, fossil fuel economy, then that's actually being extremely irresponsible and not accountable to the workers they represent that need those jobs and need those protections in the, the transition to renewable energy. Um, and so, yeah, I think that coalition emerged um, to pass the IRA because of the organizing around people's like shared self-interest and like really making that clear and that I think it will continue to happen and only expand as um, the there's actually money towards these projects now. Um, and so it's not an abstract uh, ideology or political education. It's like literally people's jobs are now building, um, you know, battery plants and building um, new electric school buses. And, um, and those are just two examples of many, many, many examples. Um, and yeah, I also, um, uh, I think also we have to just have enough power to keep winning these wins and the way that we do that is through collective action and like mass participation and um yeah one movement can't win uh an economic reform um you know or democratic reform overhaul etc on its own um that has never been the case and so yeah we i think just the, the labor movement has a lot of people <laughs> as, uh, you know, as their political capital. Um, and um, that means that, like, the climate movement needs the labor movement together um, to win these wins, um, as do, you know, the racial justice movement. And, um, yeah, all, we all just, like, have a shared stake. And as long as we're actually, like, moving towards what... Um, yeah, the ideology of what affects all of us versus them, um, we're going to be in a much better position to actually win what we need and sustain those wins. Um, and so I think some of that is actually crystallizing, which is beautiful. Um, and um, yeah, I think will continue to happen under whichever administration, um, and it will take different forms. But I think we're, that tide is happening. Yeah, um, that's that's really great, um, and and also something that's very hopeful in a, in a situation that's not always um, the most hopeful when we when we look at the numbers and the science. But seeing seeing movements actually come forward and do that, um, especially coming together. Um, I had a question, kind of going off those uh, like that, not just the coalition building, but then going from coalition building and the movements um, into questions of actual like strategy uh tactics right um you can build these great coalitions you get people together um and you personally have been someone who's done been involved with multiple different strategies right uh very famously sunrise had the sit-in in nancy pelosi's office in 2018 and then also chuck schumer's office in 2022 with the ira and that's one tactic right um but there were also other tactics right directly lobbying legislators um making sure to elect people, um, sometimes uh, in, in very different districts, right, um, with different voting bases. And I'd like to know how you see, like, different strategies and tactics working together um, that you've done as part of the, uh, as, as one of the big names in the climate movement, but then also um, what you've seen that it has, has not been the most effective, right, where it's felt like the work was put in and, and the outcome wasn't commensurate with, with the labor that was done. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I appreciate this question because uh, I think often it's like taken for granted that the kind of craft and expertise of thinking like, how are we going to actually like make a shift um, and make this have like a, a national, um, yeah, take our take our movement demands and then force them into national conversation, force politicians to take a side on the matter. Um, and then 
translate that into, you know, something concrete that we need them to support um, and making the choice really clear for them. And then obviously like making it that more and more of the public is on our side. Um, and yeah, I think some of the main things that kind of are underneath the tactical choices um, are confrontation and polarization. Um, and so I think what has worked a lot is um, not having just kind of generic big demands, um, but and then having it not be targeted to an individual with decision making power um, who is supposed to represent the best interest of their constituents um, and, you know, be in public service. So we we often like to take, uh, you know, some of the the bigger demands and um, gatherings of people and make sure they're actually like targeted towards who is in the position of leadership, like who gets to actually make this decision. Um, and that's where some of the sit-ins came in, but also, um, yeah, longer campaigning of saying like, we keep presenting this choice to you and the public knows what's right because we are organizing them and they are having their experiences of knowing what they need. Um, and, you know, either you can choose to be on our side and actually do what your constituents need um, and we're presenting them that choice. Or if you keep saying no, like we're going to also do the work to make sure we have an organized base in your district, in your state, et cetera. Um, and it might take a few cycles, um, but we're going to make sure that the public sees that there needs to be new leadership because you're not actually um, taking up the mantle of the choice we've been giving you and you're not actually doing what is in the best interest of your district. And we need to find someone else um, who will do that. And that does take many cycles, but um, the kind of deeper work of making sure it's not just rhetorical and smoke and mirrors and saying like, we're going to vote you out. Like we actually need to organize people in that district over time and um, make sure that threat is real. Um, and so, yeah, the some of the kind of um, shiny sit-ins like definitely play a role of creating that choice um, and making the public feel like, oh shit, like why aren't they just clearly choosing what <laughs> what we need? Um, what's behind this? And, um, you know, and like driving a wedge in the narrative, but then, you know, surrounding the, the shiny sit-in is like the deeper organizing work, the candidate recruitment work, obviously <laughs> fundraising, like a lot of things like that. Um, and um, yeah, and then also we need the public to know, like one sit-in is not gonna say, um, build public support for an issue. So we need to be um, doing some big mass demonstrations too, like the marches against fossil fuels or, um, you know, uh, just showing all across the country, there are people who are, um, yeah, all on the same side of um, wanting to fight the climate crisis um, justly. And that actually like there is mass public sentiment um, in, you know, building. And we see that obviously with the um, ceasefire movement as well. Like it wouldn't look like we when we pose the question um, confronting a politician, um, we need to know that they're on the same side as like the the public choice and these mass demonstrations of support globally really do the work of illustrating how there's like just immense public support and isolating that one politician from where the rest of the public is at um but yeah yeah, I, I think that's that's really instructive um, and that like like highlighting, you know, the big actions work because they have the all the work that goes in behind them, um, too, um, is is really important. And one of the things that I think is really strategically interesting about groups like Sunrise. Um, 
I'm just going to remind everybody in the room, uh, we do have the Q&A, so please put questions in there. We're going to switch to that in just a second. I've got, I think, two more questions um, to go over with Lauren before we um, jump into that, and we'd love to hear from the audience, too. So um, one thing I wanted to, to ask is, is how, like, it, it, you balance the kind of and how you see it being balanced in the climate movement in the U S um, the like, let's celebrate the wins. Um, let's, let's be very raw, raw, say, Oh, we're doing this great stuff. Um, and at the same time, recognizing the, the real scary severity of what we're looking at. Um, I think there's a lot of that actually that's, that's changed in the 2024 election. Harris and, and Walsh are, are campaigning a lot in this kind of happy warrior way, as people say, and I see a lot of that reflected in the climate movement, even when we're looking at a possible like five, six degrees increase in temperature. Um, how do you think that's something to balance? And, and why do you think it's important to claim the wins too and say, hey, we're actually doing some good stuff? Yeah, um, I think underneath this is what the role of social movements have always needed to hold um, is inspiring hope and power um, against what feels really out of our hands and what feels really um, overwhelming uh, and that, you know, decisions are make, being made far away from we're just average people and there's all these crises happening, um, you know, climate crisis, war, like uh, extreme um racism, like immigration crises, like throughout all of history and social movements have needed to say like, yes, this is absolutely terrifying and your safety is on the line. And like um, these forces are actually trying to divide us like really intensely and using really violent mechanisms to do so um, and trying to instill fear and um, and trying to make you stay home just because you're scared and would rather be isolated. Um, and movements have had to combat that and just say, like, actually, we're safe when we come together. We need solidarity and not um, in name only. Like, this is actually our form of safety. Um, and this is actually how we're going to uh, take down these systems. Um, and yeah, as long as we are cynical, like they're winning um, and the status quo gets solidified. Um, and so I think that's uh, not at all unique to the climate movement and not at all unique to um, the current state of the climate crisis either. So we need to really celebrate that people coming together can achieve big things. <laughs> and that is true. And that is our entire um, theory of change um, that rests upon, you know, legacy of social movements that come before us. Um, people coming together can achieve big things. And um, yeah, and that uh, it's a lifetime of work that like <laughs> the, the big things that we achieve will compound if we keep like the fight going and that we actually need to like use those wins to inspire more people to be part of doing another big thing together. Um, and that we can't just, you know, celebrate one thing and then say like, that's going to solve our problems. Um, it needs to actually have a positive feedback of inspiring more people to believe they can be part of um, going against these systems. Um, and that is the mandate. And so I'm like, yes, sometimes it feels hard to be celebrating raw, raw, like <laughs> against um, all of these climate disasters, against global catastrophe, um, and so much loss and devastation. Um, and when we know like the Democratic Party has so many flaws and isn't representing us fully. Um, and, you know, it's talking about fracking um, and just like, how are we supposed to, yeah, um, be celebratory of their causes and embrace this um, really like happy, <laughs> um, hopeful position. And at the same time, like it is actually like our fundamental responsibility 
to do that um, and to make really clear the the terrain that we could that we like need to create so that we have the opportunity to keep this organizing and to keep growing the movement and to keep winning wins. Um, and it's just clear that under a Trump administration, um, that the conditions for our organizing um, are so much less safe and so much less generative towards what we need. Um, and so it's really about positioning the movements as like having agency and being like, what, how are we in our best interest to keep our project going of inspiring more and more people to know that safety comes through solidarity, to know that um, we win <laughs> what we need through taking action together. And the, you know, Trump and fascism is like a direct threat to that. Um, and uh, a Harris administration is an opportunity to keep that going. And so I think we, yeah, need to like contextualize all of that and that people really want to hear honesty. Like people want, they don't want to just be like, why are you celebrating all this when like shit is also so scary? And it's like, that's not going to land that well. You actually need to like do the work of like peeling back some of the layers and being like, this is why we're celebrating this. Um, it's worthy of celebration. And also, um, yeah, we're not going to let the fear mongers um, that are, you know, that are actually driven by uh, billionaires um, like seize the narrative and like make us all feel isolated and cynical like that's the alternative um so yeah yeah i, I think that's really great um and and that that being honest uh, does include also being happy about good things that happen is is oftentimes something that that i i personally see many organizers ignoring at times um and is really important to keep in mind um, I've got one last question for you, and I, I'm just going to remind people in the audience, um, please, if you want to, drop questions in the Q&A. Um, we've been going long, so if we don't have questions, that's uh, totally fine, but just want to make sure that if people do have them, we can get to them. Um, this last question is is a bit more um, about like who's in the American climate movement, right? Um, I, I think for both of us, we both started organizing um at a younger age um especially you and um there's like a new cohort of of young people coming in but there's also a cohort of people that that got started organizing really like young like in high school um the latest in college that's now finally um aging into careers moving out of school moving out of more youth activism and, and into like you know uh professions um uh and things like that um, and I, I wonder how you see um, that changing how the climate movement functions, right? There's also obviously a ton of new young people constantly coming in, um, but having like now at this point, a much broader generation of people that have done it for many years now, um, that's way bigger than previous generations, um, how you see that as like helpful to the movement and, and affecting what the movement is focusing on and doing? Yeah, yeah. Um... I am really, really grateful for um, the climate movement and kind of like youth movement infrastructure um, that have really seen the, the impact of organizing people and politicizing them and equipping them to be leaders like from a young age. Um, and that also, I mean, I think I have said this in a lot of different questions, but is actually not so unique to right now. Um, and that a lot of the movements that have come before us and a lot of the wins that we get to be recipients of um, have really garnered youth uh, energy and optimism. Um, and uh, yeah, some of that like less constrained, like not having um, people to necessarily be dependents or, um, you know, uh, careers to have. So while they're soaking up knowledge, while they're doing their own personal development, like really seizing that to give them like a place to grow and a place to take leadership. Um, so that's been true in movements throughout time. Um, and 
Yeah, I think right now, as some of the uh, kind of generation that um, of climate organizers that were quite young that came in that kind of led up to the passing of the IRA, maybe as a chapter. Um, and now some of those folks are around like 30. And um, yeah, it's there's um, natural uh, tides. And um, a lot of people that I know that I organized with, um, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, um, are applying a lot of the like politics and lessons and like continued organizing in whatever work they're doing. Um, and none of that, uh, leadership development, um, or movement experience, like just went away. It is really shaping and informing all of the work at, I know a lot of people have gone, you know, back to where they grew up and are doing a lot of local or state organizing um, and are applying a lot of the lessons maybe from national organizing or from our social movements to, uh, you know, governance and winning elections and demanding wins and polarization um, in the in a local sphere. Um, other people I know are in the Biden administration and um, applying a lot of those organizing skills there to make sure we're like extracting every possible win we can, um, celebrating that and have the feedback cycle. Um, yeah, and for me, for example, I am now um, doing political work and leading another social movement um, that I see as like deeply connected to uh, the climate movement and climate justice. Um, and yeah, uh, I bring, I like, I'm very grounded in that every day and the, both the lessons I take, um, from my work at Sunrise and also just the content, the, the consistent ideology of like, I know how we can win and what we need and, um, have a power analysis. And as long as I'm, um, doing work with a Jewish social movement, um, demanding, uh, that our elections um, are, you know, don't have um, big money spent in them um, and that uh, our safety as Jews comes through um, being in deep coalition with uh, all marginalized people um, and that we can't be succumbed to, um, you know, racist uh, division and isolation and fear. Um, that is the same deep rooted ideology that is needed to, um, win on the climate crisis and win, um, legislation and campaigns that benefit all of us. Um, and so I think the, the pipeline of leadership, uh, really continues. And that is also something that is heartening to me. Yeah, that, that building the pipeline, um, a good pipeline instead of a bad oil pipeline, yes. <laughs> um, is 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 so important. And and I'm you know I, I see it too in the movement, and it's really great to have you explain how you see it there as well. Um, I'm not seeing any questions from our audience, but we also talked a lot longer um, than I had planned, which I think is perfectly fine. Um, and I'd like to thank you first and foremost for taking the time, um, out of your day to, to come and, and talk to us on this. Um, I think it's been incredibly informative. Um, and I just want to tell everybody in the audience, uh, we're going to have our next event on October 2nd. We'll be talking about digital policy with Dr. Daryl West and how the two candidates relate to that, what the transatlantic space might look like on digital policy under both administrations. Um, and uh, the future of the internet in some ways, um, based on what the US does. So thank you, Lauren. Thank you everybody for attending. Um, and yeah, we'll see you, in, uh, we'll see our audience in two weeks. It was a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Bye.